All right, welcome back to Monetize Media. I am Kyle Scott. And I am Jason Zernicki. So on today's episode, we speak with Jason Barrett. Uh, he is the founder of Barrett Sports Media, which is a website and media brand that covers the sports talk radio, sports media, and now news media industries. Jason, what do you like so much about how Mr. Barrett has built out his little mini media empire? I think you're, what you're going to hear here, here is the word relationship, very deep relationships uh, over years in the industry and how he's been able to utilize those relationships to then go on to be his entrepreneurial project here of Barrett Sports Media, which has now uh, entered into its seventh year since beginning in 2015. So a lot of good anecdotes coming our way uh, for somebody potentially who's starting a new business or is already in one. So Jason has a very deep background in sports talk media and sports radio. He's leveraged that to create this media brand that everyone, I mean, the who's who of the industry from the president of ESPN to the CEO of Barstool Sports consume, they go to his conferences. He has leveraged that background to create this brand and he uses that for consulting opportunities, which is his primary method of monetizing. But... He also has a number of other ways. He, he sells advertising, he hosts events, he takes subscriptions, he even has a job board. So this, to me, Jason, is like right in our wheelhouse because he's doing a little bit of everything and building like a multi-channel brand within a very specific niche. This podcast will speak to a lot of people who are trying new things, they're willing to try new things, um, understanding that it doesn't always all work the way it's supposed to, but something could end up being a loss leader to something else within your, uh, within your business. So it, it's, it's interesting to hear this practical application of, I don't want to call him a jack of all trades. He's just willing to try things. He knows what's knows what works within his industry. Uh, but Jason's certainly, uh, not shy in trying to figure out what works and, uh, and being experimental. Yeah, tries everything and then is willing to just go deep with this audience. And everything he does is is getting at just becoming more engaged and getting a deeper relationship with the most powerful people in sports media. So uh, listen now as Barrett talks about making the switch from radio to self-employment, uh, building in a niche, maintaining deep relationships, and then also how he prices his consulting opportunities, which is something that has a lot of variability. So it's good to hear how he thinks about pricing for his time. And listen for the one tool that he cannot do without. The one tool he cannot do without. On to the interview. All right. want to welcome Jason Barrett to the show. Jason owns and operates Barrett Media, a full-service sports and news media consulting company, which helps brands and individuals enjoy success in the audio space. He also serves the chief editor of the sports radio industry's premier website, Barrett Sports Media. Uh, site features industry news, expert opinions, analysis, research, and information to benefit experienced and aspiring broadcasters. Jason has spent 25 years in the radio industry, developing a passion for content creation, discovering and developing talent, designing social media and podcasting strategies, and pushing brands to the top of the ratings ladder. Over his career, he's worked with the likes of sports media luminaries like Dan Patrick, Keith Olbermann, Doug Gottlieb, and many others. Jason. Welcome to the show, and thanks for joining. You got it. Appreciate you guys having me. So, how did uh, how I guess how did I do on the origin story? I took it from uh, your own your own written bio, but please give us the origin story, and particularly expand upon you know your background in radio and how it led you to create the Barrett Sports Media uh, brand and website and consultancy. Well, first you uh, you nailed it, and uh, I hate bios. You know, we all have to put them up so people know what you're about. But anytime you're writing about yourself, I don't know about you guys, but I always feel like, man, this feels really self-serving, but I have to make it easy for people to digest 25 years of work. And so, um, look, my career in general, you know, I, I spent a lot of time uh, coming up in the radio business. I worked in a real small market, paying my dues the first eight years before I got a break with ESPN. Uh, spent two years there. Uh, you mentioned Dan Patrick, Keith Oberman. That's obviously the two biggest names I produced while working in Bristol, but also had the for good fortune of working with Doug Gottlieb, Freddie Coleman, Sean Salisbury, a number of others. Uh, you know, I did a couple fill-ins with uh, Mike and Mike and Colin Cowherd. So, you know, that that was incredible training. Uh, you learn really a different element of 
what goes into great content creation when you work at a place like ESPN. Um, from there, my passion when I got there, I, you know, I thought, man, I'm just thrilled. I got an opportunity at Bristol. I'll, I'll be here the rest of my career. Uh, once I got in there, I started to realize I want to run something. I don't want to just be part of the machine. And, you know, I, I moved about a year. I was working on a show called Game Night, which was six hours a night, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I, I, I was really proud of the work I did on that show, which is what led to me being promoted to Dan's show 13 months later. And so once I got on Dan's show and I started to, you know, realize like, okay, I understand how to work with a top-notch talent, um, but there's more that I want to do. Like when you work on a show like that, you're part of a four or five person crew that go into building the show. And at the end of the day, Dan is brilliant at what he does. So, you know, even if you're not on top of things, he's going to figure out a way to make it good. From there, I started to learn, you know, okay, I've, I've proven I can do a startup kind of show in game night and I can work a top show like Dan's. I want to see if I could really test myself and build stations and lead stations. And so, uh, you know, I know where you're based, Kyle. You're you're outside of Philadelphia. I spent a few months there. Uh, thought I was going to be there for a long time. My my first big market PD job. Uh, I started what is now the Fanatic. It was on AM at the time, Sports Talk 950. Um, was only there about six months. My long story short, my family were on board when I took the job, and then realized we don't want to come here and we don't want to be here. We really liked our house in Connecticut. Can you go back to Connecticut or somewhere else? We don't want to live there. And uh, so I had to choose, you know, for the first time in my career, I'm like, man, I've worked 10 years to get to this spot. And now I got to decide, like, do I just abandon my whole family <laughs> just for a gig or do I, you know, do the right thing by the family? So uh, an opportunity had been up. St. Louis had been recruiting me for a few months ultimately took that job looking back should not have taken the job although it wound up in a better spot later I uh went into a situation station went from eight to third pretty quickly Cardinals won the World Series in 06 which was good um about a month later was told hey you're gonna have to uh let nine people go the radio station's gonna is in rough financial shape uh, ultimately the station was going to go from like third to 20th <laughs> within a year. And so I'm sitting there like, all right, I'm new program director, just left Philadelphia. The second job I take is falling apart and I'm going to have my name on this thing. So ultimately went to them, said, I want to get out of this. Let's uh, find a way out. Was sitting on the sidelines for a few months after a buyout. And then, uh, I got lucky. Bonneville launched a sports station in St. Louis, needed someone to build it. I got in there. I built it. It became really uh, successful. It's still successful. And then from there, wound up in San Francisco doing the same thing for Odyssey, which at the time was Intercom, building a station 95-7, the game, which wound up, uh, you know, continues to do really well in the market opposite the, uh, the leader KMBR. And so after that, 2015 decided, you know, I've been uh, building these stations and I've done a lot and I'm proud of it. But during that time, I was on planes every two weeks to get home to New York to spend time with my son. And, uh, you know, he was starting to get older. He was thir 13 at that time. And he had known me on planes from the time he was four to 13. Uh, every two weeks, living at my parents' house, going back on a plane. And I just said, you know, at some point, as fun as this is, I don't want my relationship with my son to be, uh, you know, sacrificed for ratings books. Um, the biggest reason why I'd not come back to New York is sports radio in New York was run by WFAN, ESPN, or Sirius. And Sirius has a brilliant leader in Steve Cohen. Mark Chernoff ran the fan and was the godfather of the format. So those jobs weren't open. And ESPN had a lot of their programming coming out of Bristol with some leadership already in place in New York. And, you know, I, I was telling you before we started talking today, like the PD role in radio is a lot like a head coach of a football team. I, once you've proven you can run the whole team, it's hard to go back and say, okay, I'll be a coordinator. And I didn't want to be a coordinator at that time. So 
I came home with literally no plan. I drove cross country, got to New York. A couple people had said to me, what do you think about consulting? And I thought consultants are usually old guys who just sit there and tell you what to do with the radio station. I really don't want to do that. Um, I just felt like it was an antiquated position and it wasn't for me. But when I got here and I started thinking about it, I said, you know, if I could be a content creator as well as a consultant, maybe the consulting will help foster building a business and turn this into something. I just tried to redefine what, you know, what the expectation was. And so here we are seven years later and we're still going, you know, and, uh, going pretty well. So it's, uh, you know, I don't, I, I knock on wood, we haven't made it. There's no guarantee that, you know, five years from now, this will still work. But for seven years, I've figured out a way to be successful and make a living. So you wanted something easier. So you decided to start your own business and make it really <laughs> easy on yourself. I, I'll tell you this. I do like the commute when you go from your upstairs bedroom to your downstairs office. And then you literally, rather than dealing with corporate red tape every day, I could walk up my driveway and get the check out of the mail. That's really nice. Uh, but as you guys know, running a business, everything about the business, win or lose, is your responsibility. And so you, there is no such thing as days off. You know, I'm on, I've got the weekends off technically, but there's always something to do. And so at the same time, I've, I've always been kind of a entrepreneur at heart. Even when I was starting my radio career, and I worked at a small station that was shut off at like six o'clock at night. I ran the board, I hosted, I sold advertising, I did marketing for the station. I learned how to be an engineer and set up broadcasts. I did play by play. And so when you are into a lot of different things, like I remember when I got hired at ESPN and they told me, we just want you to produce. And I said, are you kidding? Like, I don't have to book the guest. I don't have to cut the sound. Like I literally just work on content, really. And, uh, and they said, yeah. And I said, man, you guys have no idea how much more I can do. And I got in there and some people would come in and they would go, man, they want me to book guests and do the tape room. I said, do you have any idea how this works? Like this is, this is a luxury. You have no idea how hard it is when you're out there and you're doing all this stuff just to, you know, earn your stripes and make, make a living. And when you're self-employed, you get to do the accounting, the bookkeeping, the HR, the legal, and, and the sure. entity formation and all that. So, uh, expl so explain to our listeners then the business itself. Explain uh, you know, the three to five minute um, elevator pitch on Barrett Sports Media. And then I thought you said something in interesting. My view, uh, and then we could unpack this a bit, was that, hey, you have the website that helps create consulting opportunities. And you explained it almost in the other way around, as I have, this, I have consulting opportunities and it might help grow the website. So talk about the business and then how you view uh, the media part and the consulting as, you know, one um, being lead for the other. So I'll tell you this, and one thing you'll find is I'm not someone who pitches myself. Maybe that's bad, but I've always felt if you do good work, and especially if it's focused on a certain business, those people in that business are going to find people who know how to do good work. You know, I was fortunate. The radio resume was pretty solid that people knew me. I built a lot of relationships over the years. And I, I'm not the guy that, you know, I, I was just on a call about a month ago and I was talking to an executive and he said, you know, I don't think you've ever asked me for business in seven years. And I said, I haven't because if you had a need in seven years, I would assume you know that I can help. And I'm not going to be one of these sales guys knocking on your door all the time begging for a job. It's just not the way I'm wired. So the way I I started this, I recognized early on, like, the value that I bring out of the gate was the fact that I just walked out of a radio station. I understood the business. I understood what operators were dealing with because I just lived it. And I built a lot of stations from the ground up. And so I know the pain of going from 25th place in the ratings to top three. And so I knew that the value that I was going to add was really going to come from my programming mind and my programming experience. What I didn't want to do is build a business that was just dependent on consulting because I realized I worked with a consultant for six years while I was programming who was a, a great mentor to me. And he was built for a certain time. Like, he didn't have to worry about social media the way I did or podcasting or the way the industry is changing on. Even hiring people today is harder than it was 10 years ago. 
And, and I recognize that, look, I've got to have an excuse to show up in front of people every day. And that's being active on social. That's having a newsletter that shows up in their inbox. Because the executive at a radio station, he's not living on Twitter all day like the fan of a sports radio show. He, he is living in his inbox because he's trying to knock down things that he has to accomplish to keep a station growing. And so I, I recognized I have to have a newsletter. i got to be in social. I've got to have podcasts. All of these things go back to why would I show up? If I show up in front of you, with a email that says, please retain me for consulting, eventually you're not going to want that email. But if I show up in front of you with a content purpose and I provide value to what you do every day, you have a reason to build a relationship with me. And once we have that relationship, then it comes down to, look, if you're number one and you guys are printing money, we're probably not going to work together. That's okay. Um, but not everybody is number one. And so if you're not in that spot, when you do have a need, you'll hopefully call. And so I went into it realizing I have to start by consulting stations. And I, and I love to do it anyway. Like, you know, it's what I spent 20 years on. So working with different operators leads to revenue. But I also had to build the website as the, the marketing piece. And through doing that, I looked at the website and said, we could sell advertising on the website. I could put members on the website to reach decision makers because they're trying to advance their career. Well, that leads to subscription money. Um, if I wanted to, we haven't done this, but if I wanted to, I could put advertising on podcasts. It's just that I realize we're doing niche content that is harder when you're selling a scale business. Like we don't have 50 podcasts all out there, you know, accumulating a ton of ton of traffic to be able to go to some bigger buyers. And so then we started doing events. I would do an annual conference that brought together a lot of decision makers. Well, that leads to sponsorship opportunities. And so when you add it all up, you know, between the newsletter, the website, the podcast, the events, the consulting business, that's how we've been able to build a business that for seven years has grown, including during the pandemic where I was sitting here at the beginning of it thinking, is this going to last like this, this thing? We just did an event in New York. Two weeks later, the world shuts down. And I take three calls in the month of March and April saying, hey, we're going to have to pause business. If I was only built on consulting and not on advertising and all those other things, we would have been in, in bad shape. But because we weren't dependent on one revenue stream, we were built on five, six, seven of them. We, we were able to get through a tough period, and now we're in a pretty good spot. What does that revenue mix look like today in terms of, I guess, percentages, whatever you're willing to share? Consulting still is a majority of what I do. Um, and I'm trying to think like from a percentage, it's probably 65, 35, 70, 30. Um, you know, the consulting is still like, I love working with stations. I enjoy working, you know, with market managers, talent, working on things that are going to grow their business. I don't know that I'll ever lose that. Um, I would like to grow our advertising part to be a little stronger so I don't have to be on the phone uh, 18 times a week. Uh, that being said, you know, if that's where the business is, that's where you go. But, um, you know, when we started this thing, my, you know, fortunately, when I, you know, I gave you the radio story, when I started my radio career, I got in radio because I loved radio. I didn't get into radio thinking I was going to get rich making it in radio. And so my first full-time job, I was making $100 a week to work 40 hours a week. I showed up for 70 hours because it wasn't about money. It was about reps. I knew if I got good at it, eventually I'd make money. By the time I was in San Francisco, you know, now you're making a really great living programming a top four market station. But my mentality was still the guy who made $100 a week. I never went into this thinking, wow, I'm going to make a, a fortune in radio. So when I was building my business, I looked at this and said, can I pay the mortgage and get my kid through school? And if I do that, that's cool. I can make a living. It, never did I think we were going to have a, you know, a site with 25 writers, editors, all these different things going on. But when you start doing good work, you consult, people have a good experience, it leads to more. And that's how you ultimately grow, I think. 
we hear so many so many people talk about the freedom aspect of that like you just said like hey i could i could pay my bills i can get by and i don't have to answer to anybody and i walk to the mailbox to get my check it's a really good north star for a lot of people um you guys put out so you, you mentioned the number of people you have with the website talk about talk about um the staff how it's comprised i imagine a lot of freelancers mm-hmm. contributors any full-time staff and then you guys put out a lot of content for people who aren't familiar with this site. They should really check it out. It's a very good site, Barrett Sports Media, and it's it is the go-to for the sports radio industry and the sports media industry overall. You guys cover a lot of day-to-day daily beat content. You have more in-depth stuff. You have exclusive reporting. What does that look like from a personal standpoint, and how do you out you know farm it out to your staff as well? It's a uh, daily exhaustion. <laughs> it's. Uh... So the way I break it down, we do three things. We pump out daily news, which sometimes is original. Uh, Sometimes it's getting tips from people. Sometimes it's aggregating and telling someone, hey, Andrew Marchand broke a story. And the reason for that, like, for example, I like Andrew. we've, We've talked before, and I tell him, listen, People in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, they're going to know you. But guess what? The guy in Iowa, the guy in uh, Montana, the guy in Arizona, he may not have read the New York Post. So if I could bring more clicks your way and you're doing good work, I'm all for I don't care where the story came from. Give credit where it's due. Let them get the credit for it. They did the work. So we do news. The second part are features. You know, when I started this, one of the things that – And I just got lucky, right time, right place with doing this. I had a lot of, I I call it useless knowledge. Like I would know people in radio and I was always fascinated by, uh, you know, so many trades tell you this guy signed the contract, this station had a good ratings book. I was always interested in, well, why did they have the good ratings book? What is this guy doing that might be successful that would be applicable in another market? But Trades in general didn't tell stories about the people involved in the business. And so when I started it, I just thought, I've got programming knowledge, a lot of relationships. I was lucky. I worked in the Northeast, the Midwest, and the West Coast. I built up a lot of different relationships based on where I lived in the country. And so feature reporting on people was the second aspect of that, news and feature reporting. Tell stories on people. What do they do that is interesting let's learn their journey if there's uh you know go back a few weeks ago the Stephen a smith chris russo jj reddick event happens on first take well let's get three or four people's opinions on it and just see how they would have handled it right and then the third part of it is opinion because we have we have some people on the site who are former program directors people who are former hosts uh, some that are current hosts, some that are producers, salespeople. And I just think that's the way, in my opinion, for who we serve to provide as much perspective as possible because the salesperson is going to care about the sales column. They may not read the, you know, the host who wants to talk about the first take story. The host who likes to do talk shows, he's going to read the host piece, probably not going to read the sales piece. And so we just try to produce a lot of different content. Every day we're doing between sports and news, over 30 pieces of content uh, on the site. Uh, the makeup, the majority of it, you know, we, we've got weekly columnists. We've got bi-weekly feature reporters. Um, my main glue are I've got a webmaster. I've got a newsletter editor. They work every day. I've got a lead editor. He works every day. We're hiring uh, a second editor who will start in about a week. Uh, he'll be full-time with the site. I'm trying to ramp up right now, find the social media person to be more involved. But literally, this thing has grown from two people, myself and uh, my partner, uh, who's my main editor, Dimitri, who works on the site, to now being about five that are regular and about 20 that aren't, you know, but they are very important in the site. Um, You know, and as we go, it'll probably get to around 30, and then we'll see where we're at then. But I'll tell you the hardest part of all this is, and you probably know from when you guys have created content, you do a lot of content, but then the question becomes, is it quality content or are we just providing quantity? And then after you've got 30 pieces, let's say you say they're 30 good pieces, how do we get maximum value for that? Because you know, you've got a website and on mobile, it's harder to see stuff than it is on desktop. 
So you've got this running stream of stuff that you're like, all right, will they even find the 15th piece on this site? And then we're using social and you promote it every, you know, we've got a heavy schedule. We'll put out 40, 50 tweets a day. But Twitter timeline disappears within 15 to 20 minutes for most people. So, okay, if I don't promote this three or four times a day, are people going to see it? And, and then if I am doing that, how do I promote 30 pieces of content? So you, you have a guy who put his time in. He writes a great piece. He gets promoted one time. He's sitting there like, screw you guys. <laughs> I'm getting uh, one day of promotion, one tweet. That's it. And so I don't have the answer that's perfect for that. I just give you what, what we've gone through, um, trying to produce quality content, hope that it's digested by people, but knowing that not everything you do is going to work. Here's the key, the key difference, I think, too, especially um, you, you said the word now numerous times already, relationships, right? So the, the younger person the entrepreneurial person thinking about starting a website today. We see it all the time. They are so focused on social media. Oh, I just have to get a following and it's, and, and that's it. I'm just, it's just going to magically happen for me and then I'm going to be successful and, and it's, it's just going to be, you know, magic. But in your case, and I think in many other cases, obviously people who have been successful, it is years upon years of building relationships and hard work put into these things where, yes, it is next to impossible to compete with some of these larger media outlets, but I am sure things get picked up and shared and utilized because of your relationships. What would you say to a younger person who is thinking about, hey, whether it's sports or whether it's any other kind of vertical of starting you know, a media type of website, what piece of advice would you give them in the beginning there for them? I would say master your content before anything else. You know, first of all, it, you touched on relationships. The whole business to me comes down to two things. Can you provide great content? And do you have enough friends in the business that will hire you? If you have relationships and you have something to bring to the air or if you're working as a social media manager or if you're working as a producer, you're probably going to be hired by, by people. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that a lot – and look, I – I have a great test study. My son's 20. He's in school. He's looking to get in it. And I tell him all the time, I go, you'll get some breaks because I've worked in the business, but you ain't going to stay in a building if you're not really damn good at what you do. That's just getting in the door. Uh, getting in the door is one thing. You think Joe Buck's on TV calling games because his dad was Jack Buck? No, he's still calling games because he's damn good at calling games. And so you have to be good at what you're bringing I think too many people get fascinated by that whole part of what you just touched on, Jason, about, you know, I just got to build this brand and I have all these followers. Uh, you know how many people I've seen, I, I've helped stations hire people and there, even PDs will get caught on this. Like, hey, this guy uh, really good and he's got a following of 25,000 people and he has a podcast I've never heard of, but he's got a big following and I'll go digging through the weeds and I'm like, Hey, his podcast page has 60 followers. No one's ever engaged with it. All he did was buy Twitter followers to look good. And you bought it because, look, to his credit, it worked. You, re you answered his email. At some point, yeah, maybe you get, you know, maybe you'll get through the circle uh, and get people to look at you first because of a trick like that. Once they look at you, now can you deliver? You know, like what I look at and the way I've looked at what we do, I know we do niche content. Niche content is not going to play in a mainstream world. Like if we were writing about the Yankees and Mets and the Knicks, we're probably going to have more people just because there's a larger audience for that. So what I looked at is I'd rather reach 50 decision makers than 5,000 fans. No offense, I hope every fan that finds the website enjoys it. But I realize like if I can reach the... Jimmy Pitaro's to David Fields, those type of people, and they value what we do, we're going to be a service for their business. And if we're a service for their business, they're going to tell other people in their business to want to look at us for potential work. And then, you know, it's about having really good content that serves them because if we don't give them great original content, they'll go elsewhere. 
and we'll, we won't have much value. So I think it goes back to your question. If you have really good original content to bring to the table and you build relationships, and part of that, you should always be building relationships. I, I see people who only reach out when there's a job open. I go, reach out when there is no job open. How about this? Take the time to send an email to say, hey, I was listening to your morning show. Man, Greg and Boomer are awesome. That segment today on the Rangers was tremendous. Just want to tell you I love the station. You guys do great work. Keep doing that because a year from now, when there is an opening and you have built a relationship and people know like, hey, this guy seems like a pretty decent guy, and they're going through and there's three jobs open, you have a chance to stand out. Like I used to tell young guys when I was first starting this, I go, first of all, you have an advantage I didn't. When I started, I couldn't podcast. I didn't have YouTube. I didn't have Twitter to build a a base. I had an email on a website, which thank God that came along because previously I had to send cassettes in the mail only to get a letter telling me, you know, you're not good enough to do this yet. So I had to do all the extra stuff that a lot of these folks today didn't have. And so I would tell them, how are you not following every single decision maker in the business that you want to work in? They're all out there, whether it's on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, go find them. And then when you see them share stuff, take a minute and engage. Like a program director puts out, he's having a course light on a Sunday. Great idea, my man. You earned it. Enjoy. Do that for a while, and you watch how quickly people will want to go, hey, this seems like a pretty decent guy. I'd want to at least, I I don't know if he's the fit, but I'll have a conversation with him because there's there's a connection established. If only the only time you show up is in someone's inbox when they have something you want, that, that's not going to help you stand out, in my opinion. A lot of people want these jobs, thousands. What what separates you from anyone else looking for it? So you just hit on something really interesting, I think. You are so laser-focused on your audience. You know your target audience. They're people in the space, and you are hell-bent on serving them. Um, but talk about the... Uh, resisting the urge to go wider because all all, three of us are content guys and and a lot of people listening are as well. And it's always very easy to put up that clickbaity viral post, you know, you're in sports and media and it's, you know, I had a site that was built on a lot of that stuff. So I, I get it. We went for more scale. We didn't have a target audience, but like talk about the urge to resist, like, you know, putting up a salacious headline that is, you know, near the sports radio industry, but it's more sports because you are laser focused on that. I think so many people in, in any sort of content creation just are like, oh my God, I can get four X the traffic here. And they don't think about the fact that that traffic is more or less worthless unless they had just have hundreds of thousands or millions of views on it. I'll, I'll tell you, um, because we, First of all, I'm in a unique spot. I work with the radio industry, and I cover the radio industry. Usually they don't work together, right? So I had to decide early on, am I going to be a reporter just doing what Adam Schefter does on the radio business, which the first year, if you go back and look, I was breaking stories all over the place. But I started to realize, like, look, I really don't want to be a reporter. I want to tell stories. I, You can't be a breaking news reporter go and scorch dirt on an industry and expect them to work with you as a consultant. So I tell people all the time, listen, I have, I'm not apologizing for it. I'm more PR than I'm going to be a breaking news guy. Are there times where we're going to break stories? Yes. Um, but I'm not going to burn bridges and lose relationships and business over it. If it means that Andrew Marchant, you or anyone else beats us, tip it a cap, God bless you. Good. Now I don't have to worry about getting, uh, you know, losing an account over who got the first click, right? I think the other part of it is because I did that work for so long and I know what goes into these radio stations. And, you know, usually, you know, you're in Philadelphia, so you know, like, media was covered pretty strongly there for a long time by the Enquirer. And if you look at the Boston Globe, they do the same thing. And New York, obviously, And a lot of times when you're in the radio station building, it feels like the only time stories come out are when you screwed up or when there's like a new contract, right? You don't hear like, hey, man, that was really good. Or, hey, look at this business decision these guys made that grew their business. And so I've I've tried to be sympathetic to that. It's like, 
You know, look, I'm not really looking to bury guys who I respect, I like, and I want to see have success. I want to tell their story and maybe hit a few things that from a business conversation they could have and feel comfortable with me as opposed to feeling like, oh, man, I got to put my guard up because I'm going into this chat with someone who's just looking for that headline you talked about, right? And so because we did that, there's trust established. I'll tell you what, what's funny when you brought that up. About a year ago, we were working on some things, and we decided we were going to try. I, I would look and i go, what if we hired a barstool reporter? I, every day we're going to report on Barstool. They do a lot of great content. They break news all the time. What if we did that? And we did a little bit of what you're touching on. And I remember, and I'm big on, like, I don't care if we're first. I care that we're right. And so make sure the brand name is right. Make sure the individual in question is right. And do not put it out if we don't have it right. Because I look at it and go, if my phone rings today and it's Erica Nordini, am I going to be able to say, hey, listen, you may not like the story, but I know it's right. And I remember we reported like two things that were not right. And I had to call the reporter. I go, look, two strikes. I don't play this game. Like we're reporting on people I have professional relationships and respect for. I don't care if we got 100 extra clicks. Get it right. And then we reported a story, and um, and I know you know Spike Eskin. I love Spike. And Spike had um, hired Trista Crick. Just to give our audience some uh, context, Eric and yes. CEO of Barstool Sports. Spike Eskin is a former Philly uh, radio host. Uh, he was the program director here, and he's now uh, with uh, WFAN in New York. Correct. And so um, yep. Spike had hired this girl, Trista Crick, who had used to be at Barstool. And we put out a story that said Trista Crick joins WFAN. That was not accurate. She was doing a part-time show on FAN, but she was hired for BetQL. And something as small as that, while it may not be a big deal in the grand scheme of things, to me that day I had to sit here and go, Spike's, Spike would be right. This is not right. And our reporter, if you didn't screw up twice before, I probably would have just said, hey, look, you got to learn from this. Get the brand right. Because now how many, like the one thing that people don't understand if you're just looking at the site, you don't realize how these things are reflected inside those buildings. So if you're in that building that day, Trista Crick joins WFAN. Damn it, did I not get that job? What did I... Oh, is she coming in? Is that going to mean less hours for me? And that's the way a lot of people in radio stations look at things. And so that goes back to if you're going to do things just for the salacious headline, sure, you may, you may get more traffic. You probably will reach a larger pool. But I also think you lose a lot of respect. And for me, being based on running a business that depends on having that respect and that connection with people at the decision maker level, it's not something I'm willing to trade off. Talk about the, um, let's switch to the business models. I think it was an excellent conversation on kind of building the audience and sticking, knowing your audience and sticking to the guns. And I think part of knowing that audience and having that captive audience is it allows you to do other things. If you just go cast a wide net that's an inch deep and a mile wide, you can get some advertising dollars and you get a big enough audience. But when you have the right audience, you can, you can monetize or sell to them for lack of a better phrase in a number of different ways. So two of the ones for you, we've touched a bit on a lot on consulting. Talk about you also host a conference. And I think um, I've seen a lot of content businesses be able to um, either create events or conferences off the backs of that. You're doing it well. You have major players in the sports radio industry show up to that. Talk about that from a from a content perspective, you know, what it is, but then also, you know, how it's important to your business, um, putting it together. I know they're not easy. It's not easy to put together any event, let alone a conference. And then just some of the business impact, you know, how finance, you know, how much revenue proportionally does it drive for you guys versus time, you know, time spent on it, things like that. I'll, I'll tell you again, right time, uh, right place. Um, sports radio as a whole was largely, um, not paid attention to at major conferences. Um, so much of the radio industry with, with conferences are, 
about music and business in general, but there really wasn't anything for sports radio professionals. And so when I decided to do it four or five years ago, we did a test run in Chicago. I just wanted to see, could I even get 30 or 40 program directors to show up if I did this before we put it out in public? And so we did, I think it was 2018 we did that. Um, I, I worked with the Odyssey crew there just to use their building. Didn't charge, didn't sell sponsorships, nothing. Can I even run an event on time? Can I get interesting people involved? Because I think that's important. So many people run to try to turn something into a revenue model. Well, do you have your do you have your content down? Do you have a really sound two day agenda, or are you just doing things for money? Because like the first year when we did our first public event, 2019 in LA, I had people who would offer me ten thousand dollars to be on a stage, and I would say. It's really enticing, but I know this 30 minutes will do nothing for the audience. Am I going to waste their time and ask them to travel here for something that might be self-serving and maybe fattens my wallet, but really doesn't benefit my audience? So if it doesn't benefit them, what, what is the final takeaway? I went there and that was a tune out and wasn't really worth it. Well, I don't want to do that. So if I lose 10 grand to ultimately put on a better show. I'm confident that over time you'll generate better money if you uh, do a good job first. And so when I went into it, my, my rationale for doing the event was, first of all, it's not being serviced, so I think I can get people. I also, back to the relationship part, I got a lot of relationships. And so, you know, when you build a lot of relationships and you've worked with a lot of people, it helps you with building a two-day event. So what, what we created was a two-day event, 9A to 5P. I give people an hour off to get out of the room because I know networking's important and everyone's got to eat. And so two-day event, put on. it's called the BSM Summit. We sell sponsorships in it, uh, get a lot of big decision makers, talent, agents, ad professionals, because I want people to come out of there going, that's a sports radio or sports media because there are TV parts to it. Um, business conference is can someone coming here feel like they built some relationships they learned some things that are going to help them do their job better and ultimately make more money if if they can leave there after because look they're going to be parts of it where people are there to connect and you know talk business in the hall you're not going to get everybody to listen to every single thing you do which is why we try to have a lot of different stuff um, I, I think my only advice to anyone who's even entertaining that is focus on doing a good show first and then worry about how you're going to monetize it. As long as my goal going in was I just can't lose money. If I rent the venue, if I put a, you know some resources into you got to be on the hook with hotels, which can be a pain in the ass. But if you do that and you make sure that your first goal is this is a two-day marketing exercise for the brand because not only do you get people in the room it leads to a lot of social content where people start looking at what you did uh, and then they want to get involved in it and so the first year we made a few grand on the event which I was just thankful we didn't lose money um, over the last two years it's been better than that um, I won't tell you like we make a killing on it but again that reputation the relationships that you extend while being in the room together, that's ultimately what leads to a spot where our revenue has tripled since doing the event. But, you know, is it ever going to be something that I'm going to go, we make a half million dollars on? Probably not. But to continue building a successful business, it has to be part of the pie. Do you charge for tickets or just sponsors? Yep. We charge for tickets um, and then we charge sponsorships. Yep. And, and that's, you know, the, the tickets are ultimately how you're offsetting the building cost, the hotel that you got to be on the hook for. We do a uh, kickoff party the night before the first day of the event, and then we do an after party after the first day's event. And so, you know, when you're renting venues and you want free booze and free food, you know, six, seven, eight grand a pop, well, you add it all up, it it costs about $50,000 to run. You know, it's not uh, it's not cheap. But once you add it all up and you sell tickets and advertising sponsorships, 
if you and and you know we market it for six to eight months and so because we get good people where we haven't been on the hook yet where uh i've looked at it and said what the hell did i just spend eight months doing this again for to lose 15 grand then why am i doing it there's some serious names by the way for for listeners who may not you know have in the car or something like that not, not have the computer in front of them i mean you're, you're this is no joke. I mean, huge ESPN personalities, Colin Cowherd over at Fox Radio, um, yeah, Mike Francesa. I mean, th- this is this is this is no small summit in terms of radio personalities. Look, I, I'll tell you uh, when I put it on that. That's always my goal. Is I want the Jimmy Pitaro and John Skipper who were at our last show to be there because I know that matters to the decision maker. I want the Craig Carton and Mike and the Mad Dog because I know that matters to the host, the producer, the decision maker. Like everybody wants to hear from great talent how they do things that have made them ultra successful, right? I want some parts in there that are going to serve sales because ultimately you have to make revenue in this business to continue to have a business. Um, I want to touch on the digital aspect because I know programmers and digital are go hand in hand these days and you got to know how to play in that space. And so we'll do sports betting. We'll do executive level. We'll do host. And when we're trying to do those things, I look at it and I go, well, if we're going to do a sports betting session, I want the head of DraftKings, the head of FanDuel, the head of uh, Penn national, like, and you know, when you, when you do it over a few years, like maybe you don't get them this year, but if you do something good this year, they'll want to be part of it next year. And so that's literally what's happened. Like the first year we had Cowherd and Jim Rome, then it led to Francesa being involved in year the, the New York show. Then it leads to Carton being involved. And, you know, the better, it, you know, the more it grows, the more people want to be part of it. And if you're listening, you're not familiar with those names, so you're being modest. You just, you named the CEO of Barstool Sports, uh, some of the heads of DraftKings and FanDuel, uh, major uh, national leading personalities like Colin Cowherd, New York radio host, uh, and the head of ESPN. So you've, you know, those are like the, the uh, creme de la creme of sports media guests. You were getting some really um, impressive people out at these events and obviously driving value for people who show up. I go into it all the time and it's the way I programmed, you know, I want to do something big that people talk about. And if it's not good, and it, it winds up being really good but not great, doesn't mean it's still not good. Uh, I'll go in and I'll go, we had Erica Nordini, and she was awesome a few years ago. Why didn't we have Portnoy on stage? Like, that that's just how I'm built. It doesn't mean that it would have been better. doesn't mean that it wasn't great the way it was. But I'm always looking, going, okay, cool, we have Pat McAfee. Could I have had Cowherd and Lebetard share the stage with them? That would have turned it into something that everybody talked about for five years. So – you aim for that, and then you you know you realistically know like it's not going to always work out perfect. But if you do enough good things, I think more people get value out of coming, which is why we've been able to do it for four years. Yeah, I've seen Francesa has you know obviously now moved on to a podcast format, um, and I, I don't want to say as if he's progressed to that obviously with the retirement and all. But my, one of my most curious questions for you is seeing how now the accessibility to have a microphone in front of you and have an app, a podcast on Apple. And do you, do you think, and have you seen some of your the people in the, in the industry come to you for advice as they are kind of progressing to a podcast format, whether it's something on the side? Um, do you also see the consulting side of your business going more that way in the future? Or is it like, Hey, sports radio is, gone through its ups and downs, but it's never going away. It, it's a combination. Um, you know, I don't do a lot of one-on-one talent coaching and advice stuff. Uh, I did early on. I learned real quick. It, it, it leads to my phone, you know, being busy with a lot of calls that though we may be good friends, it's not business. Uh, and everybody wants your advice on ultimately how to get a job. And so, my advice is don't talk to me, just go work on getting a job, <laughs> you know? So what I do a lot, um, and this has really grown over the last few years, I've got radio clients because I still believe, you know, although the world may be going more digital, it doesn't mean sports radio is not alive and well on streams and that it's not going to remain ultra important in the future. Um, 
I also work with some podcast companies and have helped them build some stuff. Uh, I've also worked in the sports betting space with some sports betting operators that have done things along the lines of what you're talking about. Like I know Mike is doing that, but there are a lot of content creators out there because sports betting's become a bigger, bigger deal for a lot of uh, people who are leaving mainstream because the dollars are just higher in that space. And so it's still audio creation, it's still content creation. It's just you, you know, you have to be nimble. I think. You know, although I may have traditional radio roots and that is still, you know, something I have a really good handle on, you got to, you know, you'd be under a rock if you're not paying attention to where podcasts are going, how sports betting's blossoming somewhere down the road. Who knows? We might have a, a freaking crypto station, you know, like that's just the world that we're in. And if opportunities come up, it's your job to go, OK, we may not have been talking about this five years ago, but now it's growing how are we going to play in this space? Because there's revenue to be made and there's an audience to serve. At the end of the day, it's an audience and it's the audio format and uh, there's enough learnings that can go across across mediums, I guess. Um, the uh, One more like a specific uh, site business-related one then some personal ones about running the business, kind of quick hit to end. But I noticed you guys have, and I think there's another reason if you have a really engaged audience that is really targeted, uh, directories are really big. So you guys have this membership directory where people can kind of come and, and pay almost a subscription to kind of see and be seen by your audience. And then you have a job board, right? And I, I've seen this work for, you know, you know, some far flung verticals, but because they have such a unique audience and a captive audience, you have people who want to market themselves and then businesses who need to come find and pluck those people. Talk about how that's been important for the site uh, having that and then, you know, just what that's meant to your audience and building it out. Like some of the stuff to build out with subscriptions and directories and lists on a website is not always super intuitive. Has that been difficult? Because it, there's a some level of like, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's coding or the web development required to actually make that stuff be seen. The uh, the membership part, we were lucky that it's, uh, we, we work with a product that was already built in. It just was easily... Uh, transferable into the site but you have to build each individual profile they have to upload audio they have to upload video and so once we had the model and we knew we wanted to put it in then it was okay like the hardest part for me with that was early on going okay we're in a world where people pay for netflix and amazon and all these things are they going to have enough money to invest in their career and am i comfortable asking them to and the one thing I realized, like, you know, pretty early on was how many kids are paying twenty to forty thousand dollars a year to go to college, all to literally get into the radio station. Literally, I'm putting you in front of them for fifteen dollars a month or hundred fifty dollars a year. And with that comes we send you job listings. Like there are jobs we don't post on the website that go to members direct because I want them to have an advantage of, hey, this is coming out. You should know about this job before it hits the public because you pay to be involved with us. Um, on top of it, hey, if I hear something on a demo, I may shoot you some feedback or one of my partners may do that and go, hey, if you're looking to make strides here and want to impress a program director who's going to listen to your audio, you might want to work on this because this is not helping you. Uh, and I can do that because I've hired people. And so, you know, th those are some of the things. Plus, we give them a discount to the summit, which I know a few people probably just uh, sign up for that reason because it saves them money in the end. So we just had to come up with something that made sense to ultimately add some extra revenue to the site. The job section, I, I will tell you that, you know, we wrestled with this about two years ago. All the trades, for the most part, outside of all access, charge you to put an ad up. We didn't, and we still don't. And I don't know that long term I'll continue that way because I, I look at how many people, the second they have a job, they're hitting us up going, can you please put it on the site? And we cross-promote it with the newsletter. And we've looked at it and said, there's revenue there. If I'm helping you staff your building, I think you know, you're paying for Indeed, right? You're paying for ZipRecruiter. You're paying uh, Inside Radio or Radio Inc., well, you know, Barrett Media is not a free business <laughs> to do all the things we are. Like early on, I asked to, used to tell talent, like, look, I don't know what you think this is. I'm, I'm trying to be accessible and I want to help. 
but I'm also not in the free information business. Like at some point to be able to do all this, we got to be able to make some money back to ultimately make it make sense. Otherwise, I'm not going to have a staff. I can't pay all these people to contribute if we're not generating some revenue to make it work. You know, when this site started the first three years, I wrote everything. There was no staff. Then I got to the point where every time I would travel to work with a client, the site would go dark for two days because <laughs> I can't work on it. And so I started, I had guys reach out and said, look, can we just be part of this? Uh, like, we want to help you. And it was a, yeah, I don't have no money to help pay you, but, you know, you want to add something cool. And then it was, I, I got to pay you something. I can't ask you to write and then not give you something. And so it was like the, here, go take your wife to dinner deal. And then now it's gotten to the point where I look at the payroll every month. I'm going, are we really writing this amount of checks? This is nuts. Like, the hardest thing I go through is you can have a job like right now we're hiring. We have like a thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 job I'm hiring for. And I look at some people who make producing salaries that are probably making twenty five to thirty five grand, And there's going to be a view like, well, are you going to really make $10,000 writing for Barrett Sports Media? I can't leave my radio gig to go do that. And I'm like, actually, I could pay you your radio gig. But you wouldn't even think about that because I don't want to attract people for the wrong reasons. Like if I went out on social every day and said, $40,000 job, I'm going to get a lot of people reaching out because they see $40,000. It doesn't mean that they really want the job or that they like what we do. They're just miserable in their current situation and want to make more money. So I want the right kind of people. And to do that, it takes a little longer to hire. So... I know I'm going around in a couple of different things there, but I just want to give some perspective as it relates to jobs because they go back to our own business. Growing, growing a staff, like, I don't write the way I used to write, and it's because I have to manage it all now. You know, I think there was some value in the fact that I wrote a lot of original stuff early on, but if you're going to have a staff of 25, someone's got to run it. You know, and I can't uh, I can't write 20 pieces of content a day and also manage all these people. It's just impossible. Been there. I went to Europe once early on running my site and I was, you know, paranoid that the whole site was going to die because I, I couldn't update it for 10 days and had a guy doing it yep. for free and, you know, wanted to bring him back goodies or something to compensate him for it. <laughs> uh, you talked about the All right. So this is a good transition. You talked about that payroll and seeing seeing the amount you're outlaying each month, right? There is a point anybody's in business for themselves or any startup or whatever, where you think it's going to fail or it's not going to work or it's not sustainable. Um, give us some, a lot of people have many of these moments. Give us at least one of those moments since 2015 that you've had where you've looked at that list and been like, uh Oh, or, Oh boy, is it, can I make this work long term? I'll tell you, I really haven't had that part yet. Um, I will tell you my, and, and I don't know, maybe that's just luck. My biggest only concern was during the pandemic, like when when the first month and a half hit and I had one station canceled because they had to cancel the format and I had two others pause. And I just thought, oh, boy, man, are we going to be is this going to turn into where I'm back to the first three years where I'm writing everything? And I would have transparent conversations with my editor like, listen, if we go down, this was a hell of a run. We did something pretty cool. And we got through like the next two months, thankfully for the last dance coming around when it did. And then I remember at the time, ESPN uh, reset their whole lineup. And they've been a good partner with the Summit over the years. They uh, decided at the right time, thankfully for us, they were going to come on for a four-month run to market the new morning show. Uh, and, and the new lineup, I should say, in general, but that was the one that got a lot of attention. And so we got an ad buy during a time that was really important for the site, which helped us get through some things. And then literally that November, I had two more advertisers come on and two new clients come on. I thought, how the hell did we end the year up when I thought we were going to go backwards during the pandemic? Um, the, the hardest part with all of that, what you're touching on, that that moment where you're sitting there like, okay, is this going to go south? My my moments where I get nervous have nothing to do with feeling like we're not going to keep growing. It's always tax time. <laughs> like my goal, I tell my crew every mm. year is, listen, I know I'm going to pay the government, 
I'd rather pay them less and pay you more. So if I've got something to write off, if I can go take an extra trip to work with a potential client, if I can invest in something new that we haven't done yet, that maybe it shrinks the overall earnings to be able to, hey, look, Uncle Sam, you're going to get your money from me, but I'd rather give one of my guys an extra five grand than the government. The government doesn't help me grow. They do. So, you know, I, I haven't went into this. Um, even though I do well and I'm, you know, in a good spot and I'm thankful that we can have a house and take care of family and not, not sit here stressing, I don't go into this thinking of how do I get rich. I go into this thinking, how do I continue to invest in the site and grow the site and grow the brand? I've had two people in the last three years reach out saying, if you ever want to sell, I'd say, cool, appreciate it. We're not where we're, we're, we're going to be yet. When we have that conversation one day, you'll hit me and it'll, it'll be a different discussion. But I'm not, I didn't go into this worried about what I turned this into a cash grab. I didn't go into it thinking I'm going to get rich on it. I go into it going, if we continue to do great work and continue to make strides in the right spaces, people are going to find it and want to be a bigger part of it. And it, it's like what you guys did. I mean, you built a great brand. And when people get to know a great brand, then it builds an audience and people are reading it every day and, can, and you're in the right space at the right time. What happens? People find your work and they go, I want to be part of that. So that's literally the, the same kind of mindset. I'm just working in a much narrower field because media coverage is different than the entire sports space. So that, that, that makes it harder, you know, in some, some regards. But the thing I always come back to is like, we may never have the traffic story that a mainstream brand will, but I've got influential people that make decisions on whether or not you can be on their platform. And that's worth a lot of money, especially if you have people like that, that read you every day and trust what you put out. Last thing for me, Jason, if you, if you had to change one thing over say the last seven years when you started BSM, what would it be? Easy. I would have gotten into news sooner um, and I wouldn't have built that brand initially on its own. Um, so I started Barrett News Media, which is a news portion of what we do. And I've got Barrett Sports Media and Barrett News Media. And I resisted it for a while only because, you know, I think sports fans really get turned off by political news talk content. Um, and I, early on, it was in my own head where when people see the word news, they're going to expect, we're going to tell you who to vote for. We're going to write about the vaccine, not recognizing that, listen, we're doing news media. I'm not doing news. Like I tell anyone who's reaching out, like, I don't care who you voted for. Don't care about your thoughts on the vaccine, gas prices, unless it has a connection to news radio and news television, not really interested in it. So it's about talk media coverage. But when we launched it, because I was worried about turning off the sports audience, I built BarrettNewsMedia.com as a separate entity. I built the social portion as a separate entity because I didn't want to blur the lines. And then we're about nine months in. The traffic is very low. The reach is very low. And I'm going, I owe it to these people who are writing here that they get discovered. Um, they're doing good work, and we're literally – swimming out in the freaking ocean that nobody sees. And um, I started looking under the hood and I'm like, well, first of all, the entire print industry was built with a news section and a sports section. And I've been worried about blurring talk media and sports media, right? And then I started to put some tweets out and I found nobody was, wasn't losing followers. In fact, in fact, I would start getting more texts, people who had other opinions. And when we launched the newsletter, I started looking and you would have thought a newsletter, okay, you're probably going to have a news media crowd here and a sports media crowd there. No, I had a lot of sports media people reading the news media stuff. And, and so, look, we're all, especially like if you're in the business and you're probably 35 to 75, you're interested in more than just sports media. You are interested in news media, especially a lot of these GMs, PDs, hosts, they work in buildings and there's two stations. And so I would have went into that sooner. Um, you know, a lot of the, when I built that brand and I still haven't went into the consulting side of that really heavily yet. 
and it's by design. I didn't want to try to take on 10 more news talk stations and not be fully functional with my sports brands that I have a lot of uh, equity and credibility with. That being said, the news talk space was over 1,900 stations. Sports was over 750. So I look at it, I go, you're talking about a space that had triple the size. And, you know, until we started telling stories on people, it was still a lot of what I talked about earlier in, in the conversation about so much of this business gets told in who signed the new deal, who landed a new rights agreement, but there really was no storytelling on it. And so we made some hires in the last two months. I'm really happy with some of them. We brought on uh, a gentleman, Andy Bloom, who used to run WIP in Philadelphia. He has a talk radio background. Uh, he's writing on the news talk side. We brought in a uh, former reporter out of Milwaukee, Jim Crines, who's doing a lot of features. And since we did that, our, our content and our traffic for it has been uh, significantly different than when we first launched the brand. So I know I gave you a long answer there, but uh, it's it's the easiest one. I go, yeah, you could have debated, should we do a summit sooner? But I like how it turned out. You know, a lot of these things, maybe I should have started with uh, a writing team sooner. Maybe I wouldn't have had three years of, you know, individual pain building something. But where we are now, I think, is a product of going through that. The news one is easy because I know, yeah, if we had just put it under the hood and I got past my own concern, we probably would have grown the site faster uh, and probably be in that even further ahead than where we are right now. Last one for me. I probably should have asked this earlier, but this is, I'm willing to bet there's a number of people who are going to listen to this and hear so much of the business is the consulting side of things, right? You don't have to go into specifics here, but what does... How do you charge people? Like, do you have a flat rate? Do you customize it per, you know, per opportunity? What does that look like? Because that's probably new to a lot of people who have an audience who might be thinking about other ways to monetize it. How do you set that up? Yeah, I think you have to um, go back to being flexible. You know, you want my time every day. Well, that's going to cost more than if you want my time once a month, right? And so I have some small market stations I work with where I'm on a monthly call. I have some that I work on a bi-weekly call, some that I'm on weekly, and some that literally want me multiple times a week. Um, you know, is it a project where am I being hired just to come in and help you for three months, find your next leader to run a radio station? Am I working with you for a full year? Am I, you know, going into a market for only two days a year to work with your staff? And I have spent a few weeks looking at what you do to study your brand and look at what's working and what's not. I mean, all of those things are different. Like when I was building this, I just, all I knew were previous things that had been done. But I think when you're building a business, you got to allow yourself to be, first of all, willing to modify whatever worked before. Doesn't mean it will work going forward. Secondly, if you only build a business, for example, if I said, I'm only going to work with clients that work with me 12 months a year. Well, I'm cutting off business that might only want me for one time a year. So do I not want to take advantage of that? How do you know that if you don't take that trip for two to three days, maybe that turns into a full-time client in the future. But you're never going to know that if you don't go out and make the trip. So that part from the consulting is definitely, you know, it all depends on Obviously, the bigger market versus the smaller market is going to have a different budget. Then it comes down to different needs, different pressures. Uh, you know, I've got some stations I work with, and literally, they want me helping them build their social strategy and digital operation. I've got others that want me reviewing ratings and content. So everything is different. And then on the website, it's kind of the same thing. You know, you have advertisers that want to be in your newsletter, be in your summit, be in... Uh, on the main page, you've got some that want to buy you for three months to only be in the newsletter, some that I do branded content creation for to own a specific series, uh, like we do a thing called the BSM Top 20, which over a seven-day period does the top 20 morning shows, midday shows, afternoon shows, national shows, program directors, stations, and podcasts, right? Well, that thing is the biggest traffic driver we have of the whole year. And so you want to be the presenting sponsor of that? Well, you're going to pay 
in that what somebody might pay in three months. But guess what? You're reaching every radio station in America in that series. So I know we're a little over here, but I, I do you have a second to expand on that? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm rolling. Because we've like those awards, the awards, anything where people are, are seeing themselves ranked in a business is is in anything is going to drive. And I think anyone putting content out there has that opportunity in whatever their field is. Talk, just talk about it, that, how important that is. Cause I think that that's so big for so many people. I, I think everyone likes to be recognized when they do good work. I think in, in general, even the world of sports, it's all the NFL is top 100. What happens the next day? How did this guy get ranked 50th and not 40th? And so I, I tell my guys all the time, if we were built on just clicks, we do lists every day because they work. That being said, I don't want to be known just for lists. So, and, and on top of it, the one thing that, and look, nobody's list is ever perfect, right? Like there are things we do. I, I literally, it, it's so hard to do it sometimes because I, I accumulate 55, 60 people who run stations across the nation and I have them vote. And I'm, I know, like, if you're running a station, you probably are not listening to 60 shows. So I'm already looking at it going, eh, this is kind of flawed in some regards. But, right, exactly. So I'm going, how can this guy listen to 50 shows? But he does read. He does look at the ratings. He does know, like, who's being paid a lot of money. So, look, I, you know, just one guy might listen to 20 shows, another guy listens to 15. Does that mean that the guy who listens to 20 knows more than the guy who listens to 15? No. So it's not perfect, but what's hard for me <laughs> sometimes, I'll get all the data, I add it up, and I see where certain things land, and I'm like, I know damn well this is not better than this other show, uh, especially based on some of the knowledge and data that I get access to. But you know what? Is it the Jason Barrett poll or is it everyone's accumulative, you know, uh, votes? And I got to add it up and just say, look, this is where the industry lies collectively. It is what it is. And so it it's a big undertaking. It takes like two months. I design most of the images. You know, I uh, now I've got some sales help, but I've sold that in the past. Um, I write all the tweets that go out promoting it. And so. It's, it's a massive undertaking. The hardest part of that, it literally, my whole Christmas vacation that's spent on the top 20, uh, putting that together. And then January, I'm trying to balance consulting calls while also working on uh, graphic creation. And so while I'm doing that, I'm also building the summit, which literally is the beginning of March. And so the, the hardest part is trying to do those two things because I, I designed the entire summit. Everything on that screen is literally my design unless it's like a, I have a speaker coming in with their own project. Um, I'm literally telling the video guy, this is what I want it to be. Cut this up. Find this three-second clip. So it's trying to do that and the top 20 and do your normal work, which one day I'll find a better process for. But right now, like... I know it works, and as long as it works, that's all I care about. Is there a single tool you use that is indispensable to you for that process? So I would tell you my son is like a Photoshop snob, so like he thinks anything that's not Photoshop is not good enough. I use Canva, and I love it uh, because I tell him, I go, Canva is Photoshop for dummies. Like, it's already built. All I got to do is change colors and fonts and I like the way it works. It's simple. I could download it. It's. I know I get a 1920 by 1080. I know it's going to look good on the screen. So you can do your Photoshop and find all your creative, you know, uh, things that, that Canva doesn't have. I'm more than happy with Canva. Jason, this has been awesome. Really appreciate it. So tell, um, plug away, you know, uh, plug the website, the socials, go for it. And we'll include them in the show notes, obviously. Yeah, simple. Um, of course. The the simple thing, BarrettSportsMedia.com is the website. Uh, follow us on social at Sports Radio PD, PD for Program Director. Uh, you know, we're on Facebook, Barrett Sports Media, and then on LinkedIn, Jason Barrett and Barrett Sports Media. So it's, I mean, if you're into me media industry content, you're going to find it in one of those spots. Um, one thing you asked me about earlier about challenges, and this will play to anyone listening, sign up for the newsletter. 
that's always the hardest part. Like, I've got it all over the website. We promote it on social. Uh, we've got about a database of about 10,000 right now, which uh, for industry people is good. That being said, you can always grow. I see some of these groups that 800,000 followers. I'm like, how the hell did you get it? Not buying a list, by the way. Where did you get 800,000 people all going on a site and putting it in? But you know, so maybe there's something there that I'm that I'm missing. But uh, I don't want to buy lists. I don't want to buy followers. I want to build it organically, and then you know, you can always play with numbers. But I'd rather know at the end of the day that I'm I'm true to what I tell people I've got, and know that if I'm going to serve advertisers, that I'm actually serving them what I know that exists and is legit, not you know some fabricated number. Jason, thank you so much. Yeah, you got it, guys. That was fun. Thank you. All right, so that was Jason Barrett of Barrett Sports Media. Jason Z. Uh, what did you think of that? I thought that was excellent. I, I thought I, I, you know, I feel like I'm a broken record. I'm always like so impressed by our guests. Um, probably because it has a lot to do with the fact that it's always in a different industry than what I've been in, and to hear someone be that successful, it's just impressive. Um, what stood out to me, and mentioned it certainly on the show, is the importance of relationships. And you know, we tried to build into that person who's new today and who thinks it's just as simple as getting a social following. And you know, the environment supports that, right, too. You go on TikTok, and all of a sudden, somebody has a ton of followers, and they got a link tree thing, and it's like, poof, I've made it in their eyes subjectively, right? And I think what we're seeing is over and over again, integrity, relationships, doing things the right way, you know, this, it's common sense that that's how you would want to run a business, but to actually see the practical uh, application of it and how it does does lead to success. Jason Barrett was a perfect example of that. Yeah, I think it's so good for the first, you know, this was our fifth interview, I guess we've recorded. Uh, they may have aired out of order, but we're seeing this from everybody now. And I think we're identifying a very early trend, which is anyone who starts creating creating content, you know, audio, written, video, whatever, your initial instinct is more bigger audience, more bigger audience, more bigger audience. And that can work. If you get, if you are Graham Steppen and you get hundreds of thousands of finance views on YouTube, every video you put out and you get millions of subscribers, you have enough of an audience where you could just collect the ad dollars and become so popular that you are a big time influencer, you get the ad dollars. And then when you sell a product, you only need to sell it to a fraction of your audience and you're going to make a lot of money. Yep. But 95, 99% of, of creators might, might still have either a part-time or full-time job in the offing, but you don't necessarily become famous or become one of these people with million, seven figure followers. You might have four or five. And that's where you need to not go the inch deep, mile wide. You need to go like a mile wide, or I'm sorry, a mile deep and a centimeter wide. And that's what that's what he's doing. And then look at all the business models it opens up for him. Yep. Now, some of those, clearly he still, he, he uses a lot of it for consulting, but that's important. So he gets these super important people. Like he was, I, I, we got a little wonky on who we were talking about and name, you know, there weren't name drops, but the names he was mentioning are like, all of the leaders in sports media, the head of ESPN, the head of Barstool, the head of New York radio stations, like these weren't just like also ran people. He has the creme de la creme of that space. And so all it takes is if he's, if he's got a thousand readers, but one of those is the head of ESPN and an opportunity comes, boom, now you've got a consulting opportunity. Then on top of that, you get um, the conferences and the job boards and all of these things have so much value to the audience that people are willing to pay for them. They're willing to go to a conference. So you, the, the instinct is always more is better. And in most cases, I think I've always felt this, but hearing our guests talk now, I'm beginning to believe that like sometimes more is more is never almost never better unless you're just becoming famous or internet famous. There's something too. I, I just thought about it as you said it. Um, you know, and I think to our listeners, you, know, you don't always have it figured out, right? Like, just to give you an example, a lot of my previous work was on a very low funnel affiliate, you know, target, right? And then when you and I started working together, you had to reel me back in quite often 
where I I would get eyes eyes wide, like, oh my God, Kyle, an app and this and that. And to your point, all of a sudden I'm starting to dig out, getting way too wide, even though all of my previous experience was whoo, like real close, small funnel kind of stuff. And you have to sometimes catch yourself. And I think Jason Barrett mentioned that in his in the, when we asked the one thing that he would change. Not that he got too wide. It was in the sense that he didn't go after the news media thing soon enough. He was he was he he stayed niched just a tad too long, in his eyes, by the way. Uh, and now he's covering the news media part of what he does, and he just regrets that he didn't start it sooner. So. It's funny how that goes. You know, you can have all that experience and success, but you still may be swayed one way out, one way in, even though you know better than that is, is just should be the case. Yeah, and, and to your point, when we started working together and I was more of the audience guy and building my audience on social and, and I was going wide and eventually it hurt me it, it because I had this, you know, this big audience of sports fans, but we never got deep with any team or in any topic. It was more gossipy. And that became really hard to monetize when the ad revenue didn't work right. We kind of lucked out with the betting and affiliate opportunity, which is why we work so well together, because then it got me looking like, okay, well, I'm going to go deep on this part of it. And I hadn't been doing that for years. And I had to get really tactical about SEO and digital marketing and really just focus on one thing. Because I wasn't, I would not have been able to have a conference. My audience, I'm guessing, in in terms of numbers, my website traffic, the social following was bigger than what Barrett Sports Media has. But I could never get people to show up to a conference, let alone the types of people that he has showing up. And that's it's a great example of you know having the right audience is more important than having having the big audience. Um, yeah. And he says it there too. And I, and I, it's another great takeaway. I think for people out there who sometimes eyes get too big, he's like, listen, if I'm getting in front of 50 decision makers, that's the most important thing to me, not getting, you know, the thousand views to 2000 views. We are all so caught up in the likes and the retweets and everything. It is so, it is so negatively impacting businesses if you allow it to. And just find what works, make sure it's something that you want to do, you know, and then make sure that you're going to optimize appropriately to make money, hence you know, monetize your media. It's just, it's amazing to hear and see people online, podcast, social, just totally lose focus of what it is that actually makes the money, what bakes the cake. You know, those ingredients all must be there. It just You just can't think like, Oh, my my bank is going to give me credit for these likes. Last I checked, it it still doesn't. Right. Yeah. And and you know we talked about focusing on the content. Um, he has a very clear focus on the monetization strategy. It's you know seventy two thir- two thirds consultancy, and then he pieces together the other stuff. But he doesn't let it distract him from the core mission, which is getting the right audience and not pretending to be a journalist. And that's a really interesting mm-hmm. distinction too. Um, I think. A lot of people might look, most native content creators on the internet, I think don't fancy themselves as journalists. But if you do try and look to a journalist to create content, but then you happen to be creating content in a niche where you want to network within that niche, now people all of a sudden have their wall up with you. And he seems, I was going to ask him, and then he talked about it, and I was, I was glad he did, about how he sort of toes both sides of that bridge. If you're covering radio, but at the same time, you want to work with these people and not have them put their wall up with you, especially if you're working with them, you're getting proprietary information. Seems like he acknowledges, like, hey, listen, we're not 60 minutes here. We can cover the industry without having to dig up salacious uh, data, and everything is driving to that one revenue model that he has. And that's important for anybody to know what it is you're driving towards and then make sure all of your efforts point towards that. You can pivot and try other things, but get one thing right and then begin. He got the consultancy right, and then he started doing uh, the events business. So now he's got another thing to do. Um, Thought that was really good. The... um, the list that he tests, uh, touched on at the end, so he does his ranking of sports media. Like you and I, if people aren't watching this, we both lit up. I think doing those is just so important. And you want to, you don't always want to do lists, as he said, but having that one ranking awards, if there's anyone in, in business anywhere, but especially in business who love a ranking 
and everyone in the industry will click on it or everyone in your target audience, it's okay to do that once or twice a year, I guess. No, I would, I would do it. I, I would, you would do it daily. Was, you would do it daily. Yeah, I would, I would, I would abuse it in such an <laughs> SEO way that my God, you know, I would, it's funny you mention it now. Cause you know, uh, I feel like I've turned into like a TikTok nerd, you know, ever since I kind of you know, stumbled upon it. And that, but like, that's a great TikTok doing, doing lists. I don't, I've yet to stumble across someone who's like, Hey, by the way, here's the top five, like finance people on TikTok. And I'm surprised that people aren't doing that. Um, and we obviously, we see it on Twitter all the time. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I, I will unabashedly accept the fact that I would, abuse an SEO factor of any kind with a list. <laughs> Daily movements on the list. <laughs> so and so <laughs> jumped from 18 to 17 this morning. Yeah. Check yeah. back tomorrow. Um, what I, all right. So let, we always like to do this. What opportunities, um, shout out to Canva, by the way, Canva is a great tool, yeah. uh, for any creator. Um, super easy to, this is not sponsored, but super easy to create images for anything on the internet or bigger. So, um, check that out. Um, but opportunities, what opportunities, if you were, if you were Jason, uh, B for a day, what would you do? And then I, I probably got a couple too. That's a good question. I, I think I would, but when I see socially, right, I don't see him talking. I, I, you know, this is a guy who likes to talk. You know, New York, uh, very confident, very he successful. Knows stuff. He knows, knows his stuff, yeah. right? I mean, it is it, it it is oozing out of him. If I'm Jason, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, and I am talking about the radio business, the sports talk business, whatever it takes, news media. Since when, I would have my face up there, talking about it once or twice a day and getting it out there. I would imagine too. If he could handle the business, it would probably would take his consultancy thing to the next level. That'd be the first thing I would do. Yeah, no, totally agreed. I think um, I, it's a job board for me. He, he doesn't charge. I was shocked to hear that companies don't have to charge to be in that. And it sounds like he's thinking about it. He's realizing the value that it brings. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those things where you got to make a decision. Like, is this just a good loss leader? Like these companies come here, they know they get value out of this, but then it forces them that forces, but it compels them to read the site and subscribe to the newsletter. So there might be other benefits that he knows he can sell ads in the newsletter. He can get them to come to conferences. So provide this one great free service. Lots of great businesses, by the way, have been built off of providing one great free service that people are used to paying for. Um, so that's an interesting, you know, pro way to differentiate yourself, but it does sound like he's thinking about it. There is big money in job boards. Oh, yeah. You go on some of these like website sales sites like Micro Acquire, um, some of these other marketplaces, Empire Flipper, uh, Empire Flippers, Flippa. You begin to see some patterns, and one of those is industry specific job boards. He has people there now. He has the eyeballs on top of just like the SEO value of a of a job search. Um, there's a lot of money to be extracted there, and he probably won't get a lot of pushback from clients because they know they get value out of it. Yeah. And obviously his, his readers do. He's worked with big names too, you know, so whether he, whether he's referring to something on the job board, whether he's talking about something on social, you know, he could use that to his advantage of, you know, an, an anecdotal story of, of working with Dan Patrick or whatever, to helping to kind of tie that all in. Maybe it gets shared. That's something I think it's certainly, uh, you know, should be up in the offing for him to try. Yeah, for sure. All right, so really good interview. If you like that and you want to hear more, uh, go to monetize.media is our website, all of the links to subscribe. You can subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcast to Monetize Media. You can now follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. Uh, no spaces, Monetize Media HQ. And Jason, did I miss anything else? We're getting used uh, to plugging just ourselves. Just make sure here. to go on to uh, your favorite podcast and give us a nice, uh, nice five-star rating five-star rating, and a review. Say something nice. Yeah. I mean, even like, yeah, tell Kyle his hair looks nice if you want. I mean, it's up to you. We need to come up with like uh, a, a shtick in our reviews. We need to request that people put something in a review. So we commit to, in a future episode, giving you something to write in the review. But for now, leave us a five-star review and tell us you like us pretty much for the algos. <laughs>